Hello, this is Balkwell from Soupweb.Zone, and welcome to my Pleasure Dome. Today we are talking about uh, Umberto Eco's book, Baudolino. Uh, this is a book that I've never heard anyone talk about in my entire life, which makes it the perfect candidate for part three of Balkwell's books. You may have heard of this book. You may even have read this book, but you have never watched a YouTube video in which I talk about this book. Unless, of course, you are watching this video for the second time. And that's the tagline for this series. So this is Baudolino by Umberto Eco, which is a book of historical fiction in which Baudolino, the main character, is a uh, son of Italian peasants who ends up being adopted by the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. And at the beginning of the novel, he meets a man named Nikitas. Nikates? Oh, man. Let me, let me look in the book. I think it's Nikitas. Nikitas, yes, who is a Greek um, noble man of sorts living incessantly in constant Inopal. And the book, they're meeting. So these two people meet, and Baudolino tells Nikitas his life story. However, the way they meet, or the situation in which they meet, is very appropriate, as we will get to. Uh, soon. First, I will explain it to you. So they meet in 1204 during the sack of Constantinople by the Latin Crusaders during the Fourth Crusade. If you don't know about the Fourth Crusade, I recommend you get to know about it by listening to me for the next uh, 30 seconds to one minute. So the Fourth Crusade, um, obviously, it takes place after the third one. Um, some Latin kings, princes, the emperor, the pope, they all get together and say, okay, let's go back, do another crusade, we've got to get the holy land back from Salah al -Din, and, you know, that's a good idea, let's go do it. And they start by going to Venice, because they need some boats. They've learned that if you want to go on a crusade, it's always a good idea to have boats, because when you go over the land, it, things get complicated pretty quick. So they go over there, the Venetians build them some beautiful boats, probably, and once all the boats are done, the doge of Venezia says, okay, that'll cost this amount of money, francs or whatever, and the crusaders don't have that amount of money or francs or whatever. And so the doge says, all right, if you guys go over and, you know, send a message to some Greek cities that haven't been paying their tithes or whatever to me, then uh, I'll give you the boats. And so the Latins begin the Fourth Crusade, their holy adventure to reclaim the Holy Land from the infidel Muslims by sacking several Christian Greek cities. And it only gets better from there. While they're doing so, they come across um, a man whose name I forget, and he is the son or nephew or brother or something of the Basilius in Constantinople, also known as the um, the Byzantine Emperor. He's the son or nephew or who I don't remember which. You know, it gets complicated over there, but. He's been exiled to Greece, and he says to the Latins, well, it'll be, I'm the true Basilius, so you better back me and take me back to Constantinople, and then, you know, I'll, I'll give you some stuff, and you can go take the Holy Land later. And so, the Latins continue their crusade against the infidel Muslims by sacking the Christian city of Constantinople. And this is where... Baudolino and Nikitas meet each other. And so uh, immediately you are thrust into a 
situation uh, in which two people from different parts of the world meet each other. They don't know much about... They know some little amount about what is going on in each other's worlds. And throughout the book, between Baudolino and Nikitas, you end up with some interesting conversation conversations in which they compare the political systems of their states. Um, Nikitas is very confused about the Holy Roman Empire, who's in control, there's a pope, there's an emperor who's also the king of Germany, but also Italy, but the Italians don't really like him, so they keep kicking him out, and then he has to come back. Um, he's got all these vassals, no one really knows what's going on. And then Baudolino says to Nikitas, so, you know, you have a, an emperor, but I guess uh, if his brother decides to just gouge his eyes out, then he becomes the emperor. And it's like, well, yeah. And then if he, you know, his nephew wants to become emperor, so he locks him up in a tower and cuts off his ears or something. So it's kind of funny, um, them talking to each other. And uh, so they're, they're having these conversations. Eventually, Baudolino decides to tell Nikitas his life story and this is the main thrust which is a word I like to use uh, in these reviews the main thrust of the book is Baudolino telling his story uh, of his life so Baudolino's sort of special power you could say is that he has the ability to tell lies that are exactly what people want to hear and eventually by those people believing them and Baudolino believing himself these lies sort of manifest and become reality. And so, sort of one of the first things that happens is Baudolino happens to come across Frederick Barbarossa, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, who is conquering or reconquering or settling down uh, some Italian city states, which is what he spent all, most of his life doing, is just going back to Italy and trying to. Uh, get them to, you know, be part of his fun time gang, and they did not want to. Um, so he meets Frederick Barbarossa, <clears throat> and he tells Frederick of this vision that he's seen of a saint that says that Frederick's going to win the next battle. And Frederick thinks, well, well that's great. Uh, you should go tell all my men in my army that and then it'll increase their morale and they can go win a battle which is what happens Frederick decides he likes Baudolino and he adopts him as his son and so that sort of begins the journey of Baudolino sort of just making up lies and then just sort of manifesting themselves and eventually Baudolino goes on a journey to the east and on this journey, so Baudolino and all his friends have, you know, he grew up in a small Italian village that is covered with fog 10 months out of the 12. And he meets some friends in Paris, which is where he goes to university. And they all have this idea of the East as literally anything can happen. If you go far enough East, anything can be there. There's unicorns, there's castles made of diamonds, there's uh, lakes of crystal, there's rivers of flaming stone, you know. They all have these ideas, um, partly mytho mythological, and then also some theological ideas. They meet a rabbi who believes that the ten lost tribes of Israel have gone east and that they can find them. Um, so they go looking for this mythical, mythical kingdom of Prester John, who lives way off in the east, and then they hope that if they go far enough, they'll all find whatever they want. And eventually, um, as the general knowledge of time goes, if you go far east enough, you reach the earthly paradise, or Eden. Um, so this sort of gets into what is very interesting and unique about this book as historical fiction. So 
a lot of historical fiction I find um, is interested in teaching you about historical events and they do so by maybe uh, putting in a character who's sort of the audience surrogate who has a you know slightly moderner perspective and sort of guiding you through these these events and what Umberto Eco does is almost the opposite he doesn't care about teaching about historical events he kind of assumes that you will know about these things beforehand so it's probably good to know about it beforehand and you'll that's how you'll get the most out of this book you you won't enjoy a lot of the conversations that I enjoyed uh, if you don't have the background of what sort of um, world these people are living in what their states are like um, what events have happened or are going to happen uh, etc um, what they believe you know there's a lot of Christian theological concepts that are uh, discussed not in huge depth mostly f for fun but um, so yeah so Umberto Eco he wants to place you into this um, he's he's not trying to teach you about historical events he is writing fiction as if he is the, the fiction is sort of embodies the historical period so this is a very medieval story like the adventure they go on features um, archetypes that are medieval in character and in this way he's trying to not take a modern view and look back on history but really put you back into the period into the mindset of these people and then just have fun with it like it's a very playful book and <clears throat> it's clear that he knows you know what he's talking about he knows a lot about the period but he's not he, he, he just wants to have a good time and so you end up with these you know there are characters who believe that the earth is the shape of a tabernacle and so he there's even diagrams of how it would work um, and then there are other maps to show where all the you know different rivers the Tiger and the Euphrates the Hellespont and what, where they all come from and how they lead to the earthly paradise there are two characters who are constantly arguing about whether it is possible for there for a vacuum to exist in space or whether it will automatically be filled before it even is created um, and never is there any sort of wink and a nod sort of like yeah I know you know that scientifically we've proven these things aren't true there's nothing like there's no character being like I wonder if things are made of atoms with uh, electrons circling around them would that be funny no it's just these people exist in the late 12th century and they believe they, the things they believe or would believe at the time as far as we uh, can reckon what they believe and I think this is a very fun way of doing historical fiction and even of looking at history in general um, it's somewhat popular to look at history and say okay it's it's kind of the same things happening you know, over there are similar themes occurring throughout history and this is a very politically convenient way because then you can graft sort of historical analogies onto our modern times to prove whatever um, political point you're you're trying to make and it's very easy to do so if you have a grasp of history you can say a lot of stuff uh, if you choose to do so but what a Berdu Eco does in this book is highlights the differences of how we see the world versus how people 800 years ago would have seen the world and obviously nobody can know you know exactly what went on back then but this is a at least a much more entertaining um, way and I think it is a way that broadens the reader's mind you know gives them some new ideas uh, a new perspective look at the world instead of you know this sort of grafting uh, historical analogies uh, mode of doing things so th this is it, it's just a great book it's a very fun book it's playful uh, there's a good adventure to it the characters are 
good enough. Most of them, I mean, when Umberto Eco sets out to make a character, he basically just comes up with a fixation or an obsession of theirs, and that's the character, which is, I mean, it works for me. I mean, it's entertaining. Um, the, the plot of the book, it did lose me a couple times. There are some attempts to put in intrigue or mystery that kind of fell flat, but overall, I think it's just a very entertaining, fun book. Highly recommended for fans of history in general, especially medieval history, crusading times, and um, things like that. It's just, it's good. Solid thumbs up. This is my most positive review on the channel thus far, um, which is good that it's positive because I'm sick of hemming and hawing about books all the time. Because I'm not a donkey, okay? I don't, I'm not just here to hem and haw. I'm here to yee-haw. Uh, anyway, hope you all enjoy my new teeth, and, uh, well, I'll see you. Uh, goodbye.